sure you all are looking forward to because there's nothing more uplifting than talking about bipolar. So we'll try and make it as entertaining as we can. We were joking around three pretty good places right now, so this should be entertaining. Um, I'm David Anderson. I am the Director of Disability Services here at Georgia College. I also have ADHD and bipolar, which means I lose my keys all the time. I get really emotional about it, start crying. <laughs> and then I start laughing when I'm during my game the whole entire time. I'm like, where are my keys? Oh, right there. So it happens. Um, I lose these. Everybody, I put them right there. Um, I'm Sarah Strickland. I am a senior community health major. Um, I'm not as funny as David is, but I will try. Um, and, um, I'm really interested in mental health because I actually was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, bipolar 2, and I've never even heard of bipolar 2 before um, a couple years ago. And I originally started here in 2007, but I was diagnosed with depression, misdiagnosed with depression my second um, semester here, and it's just been an up and down trial of trying different drugs and withdrawal and lots of really, yeah, legal drugs, lots of really fun things. <laughs> um, yeah, and, uh, you know, I finally get to the point where I'm, I'm doing pretty good, but there's always that chance that, you know, I might go down again, so we'll do. <laughs> Thank you for bringing us down. My name is Luke. Uh, I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder when I was 15, so it's been about 10 years. Um, I've been at the school for eight years, and uh, I only have a bachelor's degree, so that's pretty impressive. Um, <laughs> I really don't know what to say anymore, because so I'm staring at everyone, and everyone's staring back at me, and it kind of freaks me out. Alright, so continue on. Alright, so we were brainstorming for some ideas, and so we thought we'd do is a board association, so I'll go first because I came up with this. So, uh, bipolar, when I think bipolar, the first word that comes to mind is just exhausting. I mean, it's the most exhausting thing. And the thing we were just kind of joking about with bipolar is, like, even when you've got a handle on it, you, you never really, like, truly have it. It's always there, it's always present, and it's, you take a day off, you know, do what you're supposed to do, and bipolar comes running into your life again and just smash you right across the face. So, not to bring anybody down, um, but that was just say exhausting when I think about bullet. I would have to say embarrassing, um, mostly because some of the stuff that I've done in my life has been really, really embarrassing when I was a man. Um, for instance, I may, some of you may know me as the man that streaked through a campus building one day um, during DC's biggest meeting of the year. So, <laughs> Stupid things happen sometimes, and then you regret them afterwards. Yeah, I want to like clean. That's all I've ever done. They look, they get really irritated when I say that because like that's I was awake for like forty eight hours, but like I cleaned the whole time. I cooked for people, and I was just like the best little housewife, <coughs> non housewife, housewife, you know. So it was, it was pretty awesome, um, but also terrifying at the same time. But I would just say aggressive would be the word that I would like to use. Because it's like this big dark cloud that's just like you always see in the distance and you think you can't avoid it, you know, that it's something bad's gonna happen, you're gonna be struck by lightning and you can at any moment and you don't know when it's gonna be. Because um, we'll talk probably talk about triggers and the fact that um, you don't really have them. But uh, we'll talk about those. Uh, one of the things we were also gonna talk about is uh, when the moment hit that you found out that you're bipolar, you suspected kind of. And for me, um, Downward cycle, downward spiral. Uh, I was actually at my former workplace at UGA and was doing miserable at my job. And you get these things where like I'm going to do all this file review, I'm going to get, I'm going to get caught up, and I'm starting to just cry. It's after hours. There's nobody there. I'm like, why am I crying? I can't believe I'm crying. And I'm just having this, just I'm completely alone with thoughts. There's nothing going to happen. And the one file that I happen to open up and just could not ask for was a student with bipolar. And I started reading, and I was like, wait a second, wait a second, that's me, oh my gosh, that's me, that's me, and then my tears were starting laughing, not the manic laugh, but I was just like, ha ah, that's me, that's me, and then I had some realizations like, I shouldn't be getting this excited, that I'm bipolar. <laughs> <laughs> but yet, I'm really thrilled to death to be bipolar, and what had happened originally, and talk about it too, is I had been misdiagnosed with depression, 
And so I went on progressive meds, which did not treat the bipolar, made me gain 30 pounds, and I got more depressed. And so I became actually really for a period of time anti-meds. And it wasn't until dark cherry flavored sadness came into my life that I got over that. And it tastes like candy, so now I never miss a dose. I'm like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. So. When Christ. Uh, the moment that we grew up by four. Okay. Um, well, I was actually diagnosed um, by my third psychiatrist. Um, I've been through two other ones that were a little bit different. And I finally found one who was very plain spoken. And he just said, oh, well, you've been misdiagnosed. You don't have depression. You have bipolar depression. And I was like, what? And um, basically, bipolar depression is depression that's only can be treated through bipolar medication. So that's why when they put you know, on regular, you know, what I like to just call baby depression medication, they, um, it doesn't work because it's not, it's not going to be able to treat your depression. It's, only, it's supposed to treat generalized depression, not bipolar depression. So you have to be on bipolar medication to treat that bipolar depression. So, and that's why it's been years of me getting off and on regular depressive medication and just not understanding what the problem was. Um, and then he was like, oh, by the way, you're also ADHD, or ADD, and he, and he said, and you also have a little bit of Asperger's. And I was like, what? You know, and so um, with Asperger's, I got like, I mean, you've never heard of it, it's just another disorder, um, and basically. And um, it's, the, the, it's like a spectrum, like, say from zero to 100, you could have, like, you ever know who Sheldon Cooper is off Big Bang Theory? Like, he's got, like, Asperger's. Like, that's what everyone speculates. Like, the real, like, doesn't know any social cues at all, doesn't get that. I'm sort of like that, but I only get, like, a little bit of that. So, when people are like, oh, it was so good seeing you, and I'm like, you're right, it totally was. And then I just keep talking, like, you know. <laughs> And then they're just like, you so many, you, a lot of people have to say, you know, I have to go now. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's what you meant. You know, you're leaving. So, anyway, Luke? Um, the first time I noticed, I guess, uh, I didn't really know what it was. I was five, and I was sitting at the dinner table with my mom, and I suddenly started crying that I wanted to see my grandparents for no apparent reason. But I was actually diagnosed at, um, Ridgeview Hospital in Atlanta after trying to kill myself several times. Um, so I suppose when I really noticed that I was bipolar, it was actually years later because at first, like you guys, I was diagnosed with depression. Um, but I've always been a really hyperactive person, and so we just assumed that I was just excited all the time about everything. But um, in reality, I was having hypomanic and manic episodes that really were leading me down a destructive path. So that's most impressive way I can put that. All right. <laughs> so, um, if you guys have never heard of like manic or hypomanic or even depression, I'm just going to explain a little bit of, like what those are because we're using those terms a lot. So, let's just pretend that this stage right here is like right here. This is stable. So, this is like if everyone's stable, they're at this level here. Well, let's just pretend that the carpet's depression, like suicidal kind of depression. Well, what happens for me is that I tend to go towards the carpet. And then man is like, they tend to go towards the ceiling. Like they're very on top of the world. I mean, you guys can probably explain it better, but. Um, and then depression is not like, I'm not, for me, it's not being sad. It's not being like, oh, my boyfriend broke up with me. I'm really depressed right now. It's more like, I don't, I sleep a lot. I don't brush my teeth. I don't shower. I don't eat because it's just too much effort. It's too much effort to go downstairs. It's too much effort to walk to, when, I, when, when it was called Saga, it's too much effort to walk to Saga to eat, so I just wouldn't eat. And it's just, all I think you could do was just like sleep, because that was the easiest thing to do. And um, it's really like having 10 pound bags just suddenly falling on your shoulders, because everything is just heavier, like even walking is more difficult, and it's just, it's hard to explain, but that's kind of how it is for me. So bipolar depression, I mean, I've, been, I've, been, I've had suicidal thoughts before. I've never actually tried to commit anything, but I've, I've had thoughts of like shooting myself in the head, and those aren't normal thoughts for people to have. So, um, you know, and those can just like, they'll just kind of come out of nowhere sometimes, I mean, especially if you're in a really depressed state. So um, I tend, bipolar 2 tends to be um, hypomanic, and what hypomanic is, is like a, a lower form of manic. So where, I, where they might, streak across wherever I, I cleaned. 
and I had just all this energy just to clean, and I had tons and tons of energy, and it's like driving down the highway 100 miles an hour, but you can't hit the brake. Like, you just, you just go and go and go and go and go, and, and so you can't stop, but you can't stop yourself until you the depressive crash comes, and when it comes, it comes really hard. So that's why they say sometimes it was called manic depressive disorder, because it would be manic and so it hopefully that clears up for some people because we're, we're talking and so we obviously we know these terms because of the fact that we can live with them. So hopefully that helps you guys a little bit more. I think for me, like the bipolar low is uh, you know people are like oh you can't get out of bed. I wish it was that simple. Like continue on. I feel like I'm in the world's smallest cave, the world's most isolated, darkest. Island, just away from nowhere, and I can't relate to people. I can't talk with people. I can't communicate, um, and it's just a bad place because you just feel helpless and you feel alone, and you don't really. I know this is, okay. um, but it is what it is. And to deal with that, the process, I think those thoughts is the biggest step. And to be like, you know what, it's okay. These are these aren't normal, but for me, they're normal. And I think when I started doing that, I started being able to accept it. They realized, okay, wait a second. I'm in bipolar low right now. Okay, I'm having these thoughts, you know, and that's where for me therapy was huge and counseling was great um, because I was able to talk and have somebody just when you can unload and have all these thoughts and people not judge you is probably one of the greatest things in the world. And that's where I think it's really strong. It's not just meds, you hear me talk about how great meds are, but it's also counseling, it's having a support structure too. And I've worked hard to do that. And uh, one of the things that we talk about at work all the time is energy vampires. And one of the biggest things that I did was get rid of everybody in my life that was, the last time I had a horrific episode, I realized that I was always constantly trying to please everybody else or all these other people. And I said, you know what, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm just going to return calls. I'm just going to respond to emails. I'm going to respond to Facebook stuff. But I'm not going to actively start seeking out people. And sure enough, like, there's at least 10 or 15 people who I won't name, but they have no idea that like anything that's happened in my life in the last 10 months. They have no idea I'm the director because I didn't reach out to them. And that's been a really big kind of cleaning house type thing. And uh, like you were saying, with the, uh, the way that high transitions into low, I tend to be more rapid cycling, which means that instead of like spending a week or two weeks or a month in a depressed episode, my changes throughout the day just really quickly. Um, so. I tend to take on a whole lot of projects. Like I was a triple major here at GCSU for two years and it was just destroying me. But I was able to keep it up because I was so manic. And then all of a sudden I start making D's, I start making S's, I start making C's, and it just starts hitting me. Oh my god, I'm falling apart. And then crash. I was actually in France, in a different country, where I could speak the language but um, didn't have anybody to talk to. And that was actually like the last time that I started cutting myself. And a lot of people think that you cut yourself and do stuff like that because you're you're sad or you want to show on the outside how you feel. For me, it's anger. I am so angry at myself that I just don't think I deserve it. And if I did, I would like it. So yeah. that's my depression look. <laughs> right. And the conversely, the greatest feeling in the world is my poor eye. I've never known anything like it. It's amazing. And that was kind of the big thing with the meds, is because you, you go down low, but then you go up real high, and the meds level me out and make me real consistent, which is great. But I still get episodes, so I still go down, and what you're hoping for is, is the way I got out of it was, I'm going down, but no one to go up. And the up is the greatest thing, and now it's like, you're going to go down, but then you're going to come right up here. And for the first couple of months, I wanted the high again, I wanted the bipolar high. Because it's just, I can do anything on a bipolar high. And then I went through one more episode and I was like, you know what, I don't care how good the bipolar high is. I never want to have to experience a bipolar low ever again. And that's when I really just hit mountain biking, juicing, like the cool kind of fruits and vegetables, and um, <laughs> exercising and just being more positive and changing my lifestyle, really, I think, was the biggest thing is getting rid of all the negative stuff that I used to do. And so, Tell me, if you want to know why people go off their meds a lot of times, it's because they want that bipolar yeah. But for me, it's not like that right. at all. Like, I was awake for 48 hours straight, mm -hmm. and it was not fun. 
timing. It was not fun at all. Like, I don't like that feeling of being out of control. I don't like the feeling of, I'm not even understanding what time it was. I was just completely, I mean, my poor roommate, she had to deal with it. She was just, had no idea what was going on. You know, my friend was like, are you kidding me? You're in one of the states? And I was like, oh my gosh, you're right. You know, and I was just like, maybe I am, you know? And this was after I cooked like a, like a, a whole meal for everybody and was like cleaning up and like, you know, ah, you're right, I'm in another state. And so, you know, for me, and then, but you can't just like stop that state. It's not like, oh, I'm in a panic state. I think I'll just flip the switch. Like you just have to write it out. And it just, mine just kept just going on. And I was just, uh, it was, it was not fun for me. So I, I would never want to get off my meds just because I usually tend to go to a depressive state, but, um, the manic state was really, what triggered the manic state was me not sleeping well. And I had not been sleeping well in a consecutive like week or weeks. And sleep is really important, really, really important for bipolar people. Like, like you don't mess with their sleep. You just don't do that. Like, don't ever, like, you know, if you maybe wake them up once or twice. I mean, that's fine. But, like, if it's, like, you call them at night, like, I'm drunk, come pick me up. I'm like, no, you know, I'm just, like, phone off. You know, it's not happening. So, you know, because if you, if you don't get good sleep, then I start going, tendency to going down. You know, the first thing usually, like we were all talking, the first thing that usually goes is the teeth brushing. So if we have bad breath, that's probably like a good sign that we have, we're starting to like go downhill. It's so simple, like you would think brushing your teeth, really? It stinks. I hate it, I know, it's out of all the it's things. It's like the hardest thing to do. And then when you do it, you're just like, I am so <laughs> proud of myself. <laughs> <laughs> like, hey, I wish you could brush your teeth and take a shower. And then like a shower, you're just like, you're just like, you won the Olympic gold medal. I don't know. I, I, I get. I, I organize my entire closet and I also clean the baseboards. I hate this, I hate this, I hate this. Yeah. Throw stuff no, I was just like, by color, by size, <laughs> by color, by size. I mean, it was all, it was perfect by the end of it. Does anybody have any questions while we're just up here? Just kind of. Because <laughs> 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 we, could, we could do this all day. Like, this is so therapeutic for us right now. But, like, as Dave was saying, we can make jokes about it, but, like, People without it can't make jokes about it. It is kind of a funny double standard. When we do it, it's therapeutic. When you do it, it's tons of fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wish I had OCD. I know. I don't have any. I was actually the first thing that I was diagnosed with was OCD. Uh, I was 10. Uh, I couldn't stop washing my hands. I couldn't stop washing my hands. And if I look, if I looked at a girl with food, I was like, oh, I couldn't stop washing my hands. And if I looked at a girl with food, I had a panic attack and had to tell my mother. That's a really <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I just want to run a record right now. My life has been so much easier. <laughs> so, but a lot of times, the funny thing about anxiety disorders, like obsessive compulsive disorder, is that in children, depression often shows up as anxiety. And so we didn't really know what was wrong with me. I took a bunch of uh, blue box, which was uh, an antidepressant, and that's what I've been on for most of my life until. You know, I got into college and I started taking uh, something that was able to stabilize my mood. So, like for my life, I've for most of my life I've only known the extreme high or the extreme low, and so there was no middle ground for me. And when I finally got that middle ground, I was like, wait, no thoughts. I'm not thinking constantly. I'm not just screaming in my own brain. Like I couldn't believe this is what normal people felt like. I was like, this is a uh, Great. Yeah. <laughs> it's awesome. It's like a, it's, um, with thoughts, I mean, it's like a radio station that you hate, and you keep turning the channel, and every single song, you hate it, so you just keep turning the channel, and then it's just like this endless changing of channels, and you're laying there in bed, and you're like, I just want to go to sleep, I just want to go to sleep, and you're trying to do everything you can to go to sleep, but the channels just keep changing. It could be anything from like a movie you saw or like something somebody said, or it could be just anything, but it just like keeps replaying in your head. And that kind of is a sign that you're starting to get a little manic there. And pressurized speech is another sign of, of mania. That's when you're talking really, really fast. I can talk really fast, but when it's pressurized speech, it's like, let's see if I can do a good impression of that. Um, college versus sizes. 
<laughs> you know, or hi, my name's Sarah. It's really good to meet you. Oh my gosh, I love these carpets. The carpet's so blue, it's blue, you know, and like, and you're just like, oh, the blue carpet. Oh my gosh, the blue carpet's blue. I love the blue carpet. You know, like, and you just like, you talk like really, really fast, and people, you know, start like kind of leaning back, and you're just like, I don't know why you're leaning back, and I'm just talking, having a normal conversation, and, and I'm just like way that like my friends are just like easy. <laughs> I talk fast, <laughs> anyway. But I get it all the time, like, okay, Dave, hey, this might be one of those moments where you want to take a breath. Don't tell me to take a breath. And I just, wow, I've got a lot of great friends, bless their hearts. Because <laughs> I, I wouldn't will myself upon anybody. It's, I'm entertained, but... <laughs> one of the things that we've talked about a lot is medications. And I, I've had a lot of people who are wondering, like, why don't you just take your medications? Why don't you just deal with it? I mean, Thanks for that. Uh, people, people talk to you like, well, it's just like a diabetic. you got to take your insulin. It's not anything like that. Because there are so many repercussions to taking these medicines. I mean, I took, I could take one, I gave 60 pounds. I was 140 pounds, now I'm 205 pounds. So, I mean, I mean, there's a risk of diabetes. If you take lithium for too long, you have a risk of diabetes insipidus, which is where your kidneys don't concentrate during it. You start peeing all the time. You pee, 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 pee. <laughs> and you get tremors and you get shakes. I remember, I'm actually sitting in pressure by speech a little bit right now. Um, <laughs> One time when I was in high school, I was sitting next to the prettiest girl I'd ever seen. And um, I had just started taking a new medication. And I started talking to her and I was like, hey, how's it going? And then I... <laughs> and she was like, what is wrong with you? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> but you're cute. <laughs> it historically doesn't go over well in the courting process. <laughs> and so what was happening is an acute dystonic episode, um, which is where you cannot control your bodily movements. Um, it's like having a tick or a twitch, except with these medications, with a lot of them, it can be permanent. And so, though I don't want to be depressed, though I don't want to be extremely excited about everything, I, I also don't want that forever. Yeah. yeah, and I think that the big thing for me with my meds, the other battle was, oh, I don't want to take that. I just want to be normal without having to take that, which is weird because when I got diagnosed with ADHD way earlier, I went on Ritalin and I was like, oh my gosh, this is the greatest thing in the world. This is what normal people think like. Oh, I can focus. This is awesome. And that's focusing and you can pick up the stuff for me to do. So to be able to do it is pretty awesome. But for whatever reason, and I think it was because I got misdiagnosed with depression meds and I hated those so much um, that that was when I just really started this just love hate relationship with my meds. And if it hadn't been for dark cherry sours, which once again it's like candy. It's been awesome. <laughs> Saw a couple of hands in the back, but I don't know if people were stretching or if they actually had a question. Go ahead, let's just hang in. Yes? I have a question. Um, do any of these disorders run in your family at all? <laughs> my parents are here, so I'll tell them that. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, from some of my it's there for me, but if I say who, my parents will be like, here, here, you start burning. It's not that. Well, bipolar is technically genetic. It's genetic. There's a lot of genetic things with bipolar. So yeah, it's, it's high. There are people, and we don't really know, because they haven't really been correctly diagnosed in my family, but there definitely are people in my family that definitely have bipolar or some sort of disorder. Um, But environment plays a big role in it. Um, the symptoms that you see, the reactions that you have, have a lot to do with your environment. And I hate it when people ask that. I'm not saying I hate you. I just because <laughs> <laughs> you're Janine and I love you. Um, wearing my gang colors, you can see. They're saying what what. Um, but uh, it it scares me a lot to think that. When I have kids, they might be like me. And you don't you don't want to think that you know your kid is ever gonna be as depressed as you were at that one point. And you don't want to think that you're the one that did that to your kid. Um but that's life, so that's like I'm glad you did this. My number one greatest fear is if my kid had ADHD, it would be great to bounce off the walls and run into stuff together, it'd be awesome. <laughs> I'd have no problem with that. <laughs> but I absolutely live in fear of, like, if I was to ever, well, first of all, I have to find somebody who want to put up with me, which <laughs> is a feat in itself. And then if I was having a kid, I know the most hard is just, I know, I, I have it, I've actually had nightmares about it where 
they're gonna start crying because they're looking at Reese and they're gonna be like, great, this is me. So, but it's also good because we will know how to deal with it. Um, a lot of our parents didn't really know what they were seeing and it's not their fault. I mean, it's not, it wouldn't be my fault that my kid had that, right? You know, just like it wouldn't be your fault that your kid came out with Down syndrome. It wouldn't be your fault that your kid came out anyway, right? So you can't blame yourself for that kind of stuff, even though with the depression and stuff, you kind of want to. We're really good at blaming yourself for all that, so. David. Yes. I got a question. Okay. I'm back. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not your fault. <laughs> you know, we're talking about a lot about what's going on with, with around y'all. But I'm so excited. What's important to express is how people around you can help the USB drive. The people that are having problems. So Thank you. Let's say that you, you don't know what's going on. First of all, you need to come to the USB and say, okay, this is what we have. But then the next step is. And I want to talk about that. Yeah. What can people do, either spouse, friends, family, to help you cope? What, what are some good coping skills that we need to know? It's the biggest thing, and that was like the two edged sword for me is I finally just surrounded myself with just this great group of friends in Athens. And then I got this amazing job. And this is my, I had my dream job in Athens, and I got my other dream job here, and it was awesome. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm leaving all of them behind because my support structure was so great. A lot of talking with them. I talked with all my friends. I talked with the first thing I did was I, I just told my staff to, hey, look at I'm bipolar, this is what this means, here you go. And a lot of it is just the understanding. Not be, not being judged, but also having my friends. I've got so many friends right now that are so into, into it, they can actually see me going into an episode beforehand. And with that, because you don't see it, you don't really, you're just driving along and you don't know what's gonna happen. And the next thing you know, you're just flat smack in a bipolar episode and everything's dark. But I've got friends that are so in tune to it now. That on a phone conversation, they've happened, they're like, hey, I need to see it. I was like, why? Like, you are, you are, they call it downwards or darkwards. And I have a tendency in my speech before I go into an episode to start speaking darker. And they picked up on it, and then you can start, you know, then I just amp up all the healthy stuff I'm doing. But support structure is huge. Go for it. Uh, my parents, I need to know who here. Um, say it. They have been the strongest support I've ever had. Um, basically, they know all my triggers. They know everything. Like it's, it's really ironic when you don't know that you're about to go into an episode, and then other people can see it, and you're just like, why can't I see that? And that's something I'm trying to learn how to do is see it myself, so I can be a little bit more independent and just say, okay, well, I know what the triggers are, and I know what I'm doing, and you know. I'm able to help myself, but I mean, my parents are always there to say, you know, are you sleeping, are you eating well, are you doing this, are you doing that, and it sounds kind of nagging sometimes, but you know, at the same time, I know it's like, there's, there's a positive meaning behind it. So I think one thing to be sometimes like a silent support, like my roommate, she's very supportive in a very silent, but like strong kind of way. Like I know if I had a, an episode, or I know if I, something wrong happened, she'd be like, okay, let's do this, or are you okay, or you know, just somebody, just ask if you're okay, like, it's, it's, it's easy to ask somebody if they're okay, like, oh, are you okay, like, what's going on, you know, because we'll probably break down and tell you. <laughs> but what I wanted to say, um, before I hand it over to Luke, is like, when it comes to medication, um, I always like to, I read this in a book one time, and I, I've always sort of used this as a really good analogy, but it's, you can't help, let's just say you had to wear glasses. You can't help that you have to wear glasses, right? And other people shouldn't make fun of you because you have to wear glasses. So when you wear glasses, the world becomes clearer. Well, it's the same way with medication sometimes. If you're on the correct medication, and I use that term very strongly, the correct medication, you, you can't help that you have to need that medication, and once you use that medication, the world becomes clearer and you're able to do everything 100%. So, you want to say something? One of the things that, um, my parents have all, all been very, very helpful, um, but my dad tends to be a bit stronger than my mom, and so just being able to push someone outside of their isolation 
is usually what helps me. When I when I get depressed, I'm alone, and I stay alone on purpose because I'm just letting myself go. And um, one thing that never works is asking me if I take my meds. That guaranteed will make me angry if you ask. Like, oh, dude, you seem a little bit hyperactive today. Did you take your meds? Uh, don't ask me that. That's none of your business. Don't talk to me like that. I, I think it comes from being a child, and my parents were always asking me that. <laughs> did you take your meds today, Luke? And it's like, of course I did. I'm five. You know. But, um, <laughs> Put my pants on too, Mom. See? <laughs> but, um, it's just impressive for me. Um, but, uh, so those are the things that help. Like, my dad, for instance, even though this doesn't work for everybody, my dad will literally just tell me to stop being a pansy. <laughs> and he, he just screams at me and he'll just, he'll just say, uh, get down on the floor and start doing push ups. And I'll be on the phone with him doing these push ups. He was like, I want to hear you breathing hard. <laughs> Go jump in the river, and I was like, Dad, I can't. I don't want to get arrested. He's like, You're probably right. Don't do that. <laughs> but um, that's the kind of thing, just pushing me outside of that isolation that comes with it. Yeah, and I think going back to something you said, the, the problem that we also run into is once we know that we're getting ready to go into this dark place. Uh, for me, I don't want to bring anybody with me. I don't. I don't want anybody to be a part of this. I don't want anybody to know about it because it, it just stinks. It's horrible. And I'm always fearful that I'm going to drag people down, I'm going to bring people down. And that's the one thing that you're always, it's, conversely, what you need to be doing at times is like having as many people in your life being positive and being awesome. And what you want to do is be like, you know, like, like, I'm just going to go here. And so that's the other, trying to find that happy balance. So I'll let you in, but not you. I was thinking too while we um, were talking that, you know, sometimes um, we can use our bipolar as like an excuse. like. Especially like, well, you know, I just don't feel good today. I'm just going to go fast, you know. And and once you start that, then it's a downward spiral. And you know, for someone to come in and be like, you know, you just need to like, you know, man up or don't be such a pansy or whatever. No, we'll make you mad too. Yeah, I mean, it's not, it's not, it's not a fun thing. But like, your close friends would be like, yeah, Sarah, you know, if something's wrong with you. You need to fix that. Like, and then I'm like, you know, you're right. Maybe I should, you know, fix that because, like I said, we don't see that we're going into that spiral, but you know, we're just on the precipice of just like going straight down into it, and then that's it's usually nice if somebody can come up and be like, grab that. Yes, ma'am. On that same note, then, are there folks that would be considered enablers that would, you know, see you going down but not maybe noticing it? And you're like, you know, I think you need to go to your hiding spot and deal with that like are there on the flip side that same kind of idea you know somebody that would help you continue in that downward spiral of that depressive state by allowing you to do what you're doing my grandmother talk about the genetics thing my grandmother on my mom's side let my uncle stay in his room how many days was it yeah Half a month. a couple months so that's kind of the kind of neighbor that, that you don't want to be. Yeah, and your work probably. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I can see a top end of the ground. Uh, other questions? Yeah. Um, so to talk about the medicine thing, I actually recently had a patient who was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And you almost have a few precious hours to talk to them and engage with them. Having been a patient before, what's the best thing the nurse has ever done? <laughs> oh, man. I can tell you some things that you don't want to do. I will take notes. You, you, you don't want to be condescending. You don't want to tell them that they, they just need to get over it. You don't want to tell them that. Gosh, never oh, wow. say that. Yeah. Oh yeah. I've had people, not nurses, but I've had people like you know what, you just need to get over this. I'm like, and if I think you're using therapy <laughs> communication, you are, and I know it, and I don't like it. <laughs> I know what psychiatrists talk like, I know what psychologists talk like, I know what therapists talk like. If you talk to me like that, I'm gonna close up. You gotta be ninjas with us. Yeah. I've got a master's in counseling, I'm like, I, I know what you're doing. <laughs> and I appreciate it, but no, bad. I'm gonna have it. I've had a lifetime of training. You've had six months. <laughs>
<laughs> I think you just seeing positive and just the next the best thing you can do is try to be as positive as you can. Don't take anything personally, but you know it, it's really it's just a, a you're fortunate person. Yeah. If you're just like we don't have a problem. If you're just like, you know, we're just as best you can. Yes, exactly. Um you know, my my grandmother even said she goes, she's Japanese, so this is what I'm gonna say this way. She goes, you know, this one time I was depressed, but I just got out of it. And I said, okay, grandma. You know, and people are they just don't understand, you know, and you're you're not gonna understand because you you haven't gone through the same thing, and I might not understand what you've gone through either. So the best thing to do is meet somewhere halfway. Where you can be like, listen, I know you're going through a rough time. I don't really understand it. How is the best way I can help you? Yeah. Also, we go through some stuff in the nursing program that um, talking about the therapeutic relationship and when to end it and when to you know really dig in. And there are times that if if we've been going at a good pace and then I stop, that you're gonna have to push me. And you, I mean, you got to call me out on it. You know. Um, but that's not safe to do at the very beginning. Yeah. Um, for instance, I'll, I hope you don't mind me bringing it up. Uh, I worked with Barbara for a few, Barbara Jackson, is it right? Um, a couple of years ago. And there was a time in therapy where she, she just goes, Luke, I'm going to be a little bit hard on you right now. I hope you're ready for this. <laughs> and it worked, you know, it really, really worked. And then afterwards, she was like, Are you okay? <laughs> but, you know, sometimes that's what it yeah, and you can give it that prep. It's always good to be like, this is this is not going to be what you want to hear right now, David. However, we're ready to have this conversation, and I can get that prep instead of just launching into it. That is always helpful to be like, this is where we're going. Here you go. Okay. One of our, I don't know about you guys, I'm just going to say one of our favorite things to do when we isolate. It's not just us isolating ourselves away from the world. We will isolate and stay on one topic. We're not going to get past that topic. We're just going to talk about that topic over and over and over again. As soon as you think we've solved it, I'm coming back to the same topic, and I'm going to have a new perspective on it, and it's going to be just stuck. So at that point, you do have to push and say, you know what? You can't keep going on the same topic. We're not going to solve anything if you keep going back to the same thing. Example of a topic. Mm. Yes, <laughs> but I don't want to. <laughs> um, for me, it's it's always something that I can't solve, and that sometimes comes in the form of uh, relationships, um, friendships, girlfriends, everything. If I can't fix it right away, or if I can never fix it, there's no closure. I can't stop, and I'm going to keep coming back to it over and over and over. Yeah, I, that's the one thing that kind of is, was telling them the worst thing about it is now that I'm stable, now that I get a handle on it, uh, is just all the relationships that I, I've ruined. I mean, I had some amazing women in my life that wanted to do nothing but like be a part of my life and take care of me, and I'd be like, I didn't just burn bridges, I blew them up. Which is great because now they're all married and have kids, and we are friends on Facebook, which is depressing. I'm like, oh, look at how happy you are with that guy and these beautiful kids. That could have been us, but I street Oh, look at you, you're doing awesome too, and I told you to never talk to me again. This is great. So I had to stop accepting friendships from my ex, and it's just not good anymore. I'm just like, but we do get better at it over time. I think I've gotten a lot better. Just being able to force myself to get away from it. Did I cut off the microphone? I don't know. If it's on, if it's on, it's on, it's it's on so I'm going to go with it's on. <laughs> <laughs> yes, in the back. Um, you say I think you can take notions like trigger. Can you like explain that a little more and like give an example? <laughs> there are no triggers. For me, at least. Oh, okay. There aren't any. Um, we talked about this earlier because somebody mentioned it. Like, I know. And it's like it's probably my mom. It's like, really hard for me because like I'm ADD and it's been ringing and I just can't stand it. I'm, I'm stressed. <laughs> I get stressed out to the point.
point where, I mean, I get to the point where, like, if, for nursing especially, <laughs> if, if, I get to, if I get to a certain point in studying, um, like the night, uh, a couple days before, I literally just shut down and can't study. So I have to study beforehand, but stress is what usually brings it out. Sleep, lack of sleep, once I, and then that exercise, and I, I can see it starting to happen. I'm really fortunate now where I can pick up on it. And I know if I haven't slept for a couple, like I, like I sleep every time, but if I'm only getting like five or six hours, and I was joking earlier, one of the big things is that there's this like five minute window when I'm going to bed, and it's just like, close your eyes and all you want is, I'm gonna go to bed now. Do not have any thoughts come into my head. Because once a thought gets there, I'm just sitting in my bed like this. And I'm not going to sleep, and that's all I can think about, going back to whatever that thought is. I mean, it could be like what flavor of Pez I enjoy the best. <laughs> and I'm gonna tell you I've lost sleep arguing over what flavor Pez I like the best. That has actually happened before. It's strawberry. When I say that. <laughs> But, um, like, you can't say something like, you know, oh, like, my dad, he's really bad about this. He's like, you look terrible today. <laughs> and I'll be like, thanks. <laughs> you know? Like, but he's just like, you know, your eyes are just like, they're so dark. And like, you know, and he'll say something like that, you know? But that can't trigger me to be, like, depressed or, like, you know, suicidal. It doesn't help. It doesn't help at all. But it, that's just how he is, and I'm used to it by now. But, you know, like, it's just, like, nothing like that is, like, a trigger. You can wear that? I was, Mom. Thank you. Now I'm just going to go in my room and be shamed for a while. There you go. I got what you have to touch on my one more question is, Nate, do you have any, like, mental cues you give yourself on your real friend? I'm just saying, you have to give a real cue that says, I'm not going down that path, right? Yeah. Okay, or, or even maybe a physical cue that says, that's not written on my wall or in my phone says. Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, I'm real. Every, there's a, my favorite band is Pearl Jam, and there's a song called Inside Job. And every day of my life, for the last eight, nine months, that is a song I wake up to every single day. And I listen to that song every single day. It's this really awesome, empowering, amazing song about shutting doors on the past, today's gonna be a different day, I'm gonna do everything that I wanna do today, and it's this great, uplifting song. That and uh, Ooch, Ooch Island, which you probably don't know, if you've ever heard Bare Necessities? Bare Necessities. That's a song that gets me going and makes me smile. And it's great. Uh, Are you talking about like, list of things like triggers or something? No, like things that like positive, or, like things that you just want out of it. <laughs> oh yeah, my mom, yeah, I guess, yeah, she said me, but like, that's true, like, she'll call me and she'll be like, it's just, just all that she says to me is positive, and then I'll be like, eh, you know, I'll just like, go back to something negative, because I'm in, I'm in a bad state, but, you know, she, like, she can't, I can't, she can't leave me, so, you know. I have one phrase that I say over and over and over again, all the time, if you look at any visor that I have, or hat, it's, I can, I will, I am. And it's just a very awesome, empowering thing think about it. It's not that big. Now, say that 10 times, I can, I will, I am, and you can get through just about anything. So. Yeah, I have actually tons of things, because um, I'm kind of a pack rat. So, um, anything to do with France. Anything. <laughs> I love France like nobody's business. I don't love French politics. I just love the language. If I hear it, it makes me happy. And if I read it, or see it. <laughs> Can I ask a question? It's kind of a question, but kind of a statement. Yes, Mom. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> With you two guys, and you too, Luke. Um, with the medication, it's not 
isn't it true that it's not like you find the perfect medication and then you're set for the rest of your life? Can y'all address that? Yeah, I mean, it's, that's, I think for me the most thing to accept was that no matter what, no matter how good I am, no matter how hard I try, if I do everything right, I'm still going to get a high blood pressure. And I know that. The best I can do is make it as minimal as possible. And when I just finally had that realization and I just accepted it, it was a real huge kind of burden. <coughs> and that, so that was a big deal for me when I was just like, it's going to happen, and I'm just going to run with it and just try and make it as pleasant as a bipolar episode can be. I've been taking medications for so long, but you know that's true. Um, every once in a while, the medication just stops working, and you have to find something else. You have to find a new one. You have to try a new class, even though you hate it, and you're going to gain 40 pounds. You can curb that, but you usually don't. <laughs> but, yeah. And when he says class, he means class of drugs, not just like, you know, you're trying astronomy or something like that. <laughs> um, just, just saying. Um, there's a bunch of different classes of drugs, and it's all complicated, and I don't remember. But, um, yeah, I, I was on a medication for about a year, and it, it, so far it's made me gain about 50 pounds. Um, and I just got off of that, and that was a really big gamble because I could have gone really downhill really fast, but I didn't. So I'm just totally trying to lose that weight um, in a healthy way. And um, yeah, it just stopped working. I think a lot of people don't realize it, and it, they probably think that, you know, like just, oh, just take your pills and everything will be okay. I mean, First of all, you have to find the right pills. Once you find the right pills, you're hoping that they're gonna last. And I've had times where I was a straight A student and it was everything was perfect. And then all of a sudden, I could tell when my pills would stop working because all of a sudden my grades would go down. And it wasn't because I was studying less or was not working as hard. It was just because all of a sudden my world was crashing. And it's like you can't really stop that. And the only way you can stop it is to try to get on another medication, which means you have to get off of the medication that you're on, which means withdrawal symptoms. And withdrawal symptoms, I actually was supposed to be a nurse. I originally, originally was a nurse, and I came back here for nursing school. And I was originally supposed to start in a fall semester, and I was taking a summer class. But I was going through a withdrawal from one of the medications where, and I, you know, all of you guys are adults. I was vomiting every day. So um, it would make me throw up every single day to where I very thought my liver was shutting down. And then she looked really like disappointed in me because she found out that it wasn't, and I was like, it's your problem. But anyway, um, so you know, um, so I ended up having to like push my whole semester back like another semester. Um, so I started later, and um, and it didn't work out for me because the stress was too much and just a lot of other problems. And my medication stopped working actually, and I had to get off medication right in the middle of my semester of nursing, and that was like something, you can't be off your game in nursing, like you just can't be. Like I think a lot of your nursing students in here, how many, how many of you are nursing students? <laughs> <laughs> you can't be off your game in nursing, and you guys understand that, and so once you're off your game, I mean, you're just, it, it was just downhill after that, and so community, that's why I chose community health. So I think health nurses. Yeah, we are, um, so thank you all so much for being here and helping this is good therapy for us. <coughs>
Uh, in addition, we offer short-term psychiatric services in conjunction with counseling. Uh, because we emphasize short-term treatment, students uh, uh, presenting with issues that require long-term care are generally referred to off-campus providers. Uh, but even when we're not able to provide those services, we're glad to consult and help you understand what those services are. Um, counseling is free and confidential, uh, which means we won't uh, discuss the things that go on in counseling with your instructors, your family, your friends, without your permission to do that. Uh, we're located in the second floor of the Wellness Center, and we're, we see people by appointment Monday through Friday, 8 to 5. So uh, if you'd like to know more, please call our offices or check us out on the Georgia College website. Um, and really, everything and kind of just going back to how disability services work, we treat everybody case by case. So I can't really tell you, there's no like cookie cutter accommodations. Everything is, we talk with you, we look at the documentation, we put it all together and we figure out what works best for you. Um, absences, we do, do extended absences, so if you're in an episode, and that's not just for my colleagues, we're just a lot of different disabilities, they can be episodic in nature. Um, 71 note takers, you know, kind of standard kind of accommodations. But as I said before, we treat everybody case by case on an individual basis. But that's the best thing because there's no two bipolar people the same, there's no two anybody with the same disability. So, what I would say is go get the proper testing, come in, we talk, and then we start crafting what your plan is going to look like. Tell you a little bit about NAMI, what NAMI does, and uh, some of the resources here in the community. Thank you, Martha. Um, she mentioned earlier on that this is National uh, Mental Illness Awareness Week, and this is a, an event that started by NAMI back in 1980. NAMI stands for the National Alliance on Mental Illness. We have a local affiliate here in this um, trifold in front, gives you an idea of some of the activities that we get involved in during the year. But I didn't want to mention um, our primary effort here locally, the local affiliate level, is education. I think um, David and Luke can say they had a fantastic time educating us today. And it's like experiential and by her. Um, one of the things we can do is education. And I put a table up back there with uh, brochures and magazines, and feel free to take them. And if you want to get more information about NAMI, you can check their website, nami.org. Um, it's a national website and has the state, so you can click on Georgia to see where the NAMI affiliates are in Georgia. And there's several in the metro Atlanta area. Excuse me, I'm not losing my voice. We also get a magazine called the NAMI Advocate, and it, it deals mostly with um, mental health issues. Most of them are considered severe mental illness, and bipolar is one, uh, schizophrenia is another, and major depression is another. And there are brochures up there and magazines on all three of those topics. Um, two years ago, we had a speaker who, um, I'm not sure who was here two years ago, but Andrew uh, uh, Gadke spoke on his schizophrenic experiences. And the title of his book was very good decaf. And he met somebody who was uh, had a depression disorder in a coffee shop. And Andrew drank regular because the caffeine would kind of jack him up. And his depression, no, the other way around, he drank decaf and his friend drank regular because that kind of um, got him out of his depression. So that's the name of the title. It's a good book. It's up there if you have, um, if you want a copy, you can take one. If you have $10, put it down. If not, you can have it for free. Those are given to us after the, the talk two years ago. So um, those are available. Um, I guess, oh, there was one of the other activities we had related to that, and then one of us learned so it was a aero proclamation. Uh, the mayor here in town um, issued a proclamation that's having the first full week in October Mental Illness Awareness Week, and also the Georgia Mental Health Consumer Network, <clears throat> which is a different organization. I had a memorial service out of Central State Hospital last Sunday. Um, 
I usually try to attend that, but I wasn't able to this year. But it's usually a, a memorial service for the patients that were at Temple Hospital with Baby Bad while they were um, inpatient there and were buried on the hospital grounds. So it's a, a quite a moving cemetery out there on the campus. Uh, so if you have any other questions, get one of those magazines or a local phone number on that, or you can check the national website. Thank you. that is going to be going on for the next uh, year. So we have Jordan and Bree, and they're going to tell you about this uh, project that we hope.